Reinhold Messner is arguably the greatest mountaineer of the 20th century. In more recent years, Ule Steck, who was known as the Swiss machine, accomplished mountaineering and rock climbing achievements that pushed standards to a new level. But in my opinion, without Messner, there would be no Steck. Messner dreamed of climbing Himalayan mountains. He had spent a long time thinking about style and ethics and setting a new standard for big mountain adventure climbing. Messner was one of the earliest and strongest proponents of what became known as alpine-style climbing. Alpine-style climbing is climbing large mountains with minimal equipment and a minimum of outside help. This type of climbing was common in the Alps and lesser ranges, but was not often considered when thinking about the larger ranges in the world. There are 14 mountains in the world that are over 8,000 meters in height. For Westerners, that's 14 mountains over 26,246 feet. That's 14 mountains with a death zone. 14 mountains all in the Himalaya. 14 mountains that have claimed the lives of hundreds and hundreds of climbers. In 1986, Messner became the first person to summit all 14 mountains over 8,000 meters high. After having climbed Everest with a partner and without supplemental oxygen in 1978, he was overtaken by a new goal to climb Everest solo without oxygen. In 1980, he was the first person to summit Mount Everest solo and without supplemental oxygen. Upon returning, he wrote, I was in continual agony. I have never in my life been so tired as on the summit of Everest that day. I just sat and sat there, oblivious to everything. I knew I was physically at the end of my tether. Mesner was not just a climber. He's listed in the Guinness Book of Records nine times. He also crossed Antarctica on skis and participated in a 1,200-mile trek across the Gobi Desert. And from 1999 to 2004, he served as a member of the European Parliament as a representative for the Italian Green Party. As we've discussed previously, it seems that extreme athletes seek extreme challenges, and that curiosity seems to raise questions for the rest of us. Do they really know the risk? Are they ignoring the risk? Are they so prepared that the risk is mitigated to the point of it being no risk or minimal risk? Or is the risk extreme and the people are just more extreme? I could spend hours talking about Mesner and Another several hours talking about Uli Steck. Messner, though, is now the elder statesman of mountaineering and the author of more than 60 books. One of the reasons he's still relevant is that he's still alive. Sadly, Uli Steck died during a solo climb in the Himalayas in 2017. Many of his contemporaries and climbers who were inspired by Messner have died in the mountains. The list is long, and the Hall of Fame of Mountaineering could be filled many times with the names of climbers who have died in the big mountains of the world. Alaska, Patagonia, Canada, the Alps, and the Himalayas are beautiful cemeteries for some of the greatest names in mountaineering history. Maurice Wilson had the same dreams and desires of all the climbers who tried and died since his adventure of 1933 and 34. Would Maurice be in this mythical Hall of Fame for world-class mountaineers? Has anyone in history done what he attempted in the way that he attempted it? My name is Jeff Bargin, and this is a High Adventure Podcast. Hello and welcome to episode 9 of season 2 of the High Adventure Podcast. If you're new to this season, you might want to go back and catch up by listening to the previous episodes. If you're new to the High Adventure Podcast, I encourage you to go back and listen to season 1 where we drill down into the story of the 1977 Yosemite pot plane crash. That's where a plane carrying 6,000 pounds of smuggled marijuana crashed into a frozen lake in the Yosemite backcountry. If you've never heard that story, it's it's a wild one. And I want to thank you all for passing our podcast on to your friends. 
I said on the last episode that I would shout out people who reached out to me over social media, so I want to thank the folks who sent me messages. Lori from Pleasant Hill, California, and Andy in Acampo, California. Gwen and Keith who listen in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. Don Zamboni from Virginia. Jim in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Mari in Norway. Pete Whitaker and Sean Warren, both of whom sent me messages from the UK. And Amber in France. I also want to thank Scott Peterson from Portland, who's been a friend of the show since the beginning, and Steve T., who sent me a nice note after finding the podcast by accident. And a special thanks to Tony Lewis and his band The Mushrooms for the song Hard to Fly, which we've been using at the end of each episode starting way back in Season 1, but that song just seems so appropriate on so many levels. If you want to reach me, you can reach me at the High Adventure Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Twitter at High Adventure Podcast, on Facebook at The High Adventure Podcast, and on Instagram at High Adventure Podcast. We, as always, post these episodes on both our YouTube and Vimeo channels, and both these channels can be found under our company name of Accidental Productions. Okay, here's my commercial. If you're trapped indoors and looking for something to watch, take a look at Assault and El Capitan, our film about Amon McNeely's second ascent of the route Wings of Steel, which is Yosemite's most controversial climb. That story itself is insane. Amon McNeely is cut from the same cloth as the adventure athletes we've discussed in this series. In fact, he's he's an inspiration for adventure extreme athletes around the world. And you have to look into Ammon's story to see why, but trust me, his story is worth the time. It's available on Amazon Prime and streaming sites everywhere. We've just also retooled and in the last few months relaunched our new website, accidentalproductions.net. Take a look and tell us what you think. In the previous episode, Maurice made his way into Tibet and has for the first time seen the entire expanse of Everest and the surrounding peaks. As Maurice makes his way closer to the slopes of Everest and the air gets thinner and the elements more extreme. It's important to remember that though Maurice has shown otherworldly tenacity and perseverance, he is a man with severe limitations. We've spoken extensively about Maurice's damaged and nearly useless left arm, but remember that Maurice also suffered from TB or tuberculosis, which is a pulmonary disease that affects the lungs. Keep that in mind when thinking about Maurice trekking 300 miles in high altitude and trying to navigate the elevations of Everest. Maurice also suffered from what was then called a nervous breakdown several years before his trip. That description of a nervous breakdown may not be completely accurate. The nervous breakdown seems to be such a generic description. Maurice most certainly suffered from what was called in World War I shell shock, and later in World War II was known as battle fatigue. And now we call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, or PTSD, so there's very little question that Maurice was suffering from PTSD. So here we have a one-armed guy with PTSD and TB at the base of the highest mountain in the world. It's hard to say that this might be the hardest part of the trip, given what he's already been through. Sometimes dreams and ideas change when faced with actuality. Mountains, rivers, deserts are not so intimidating to look at and seem downright reasonable when you're seeing them on maps and in modern times in photos or on film. Pictures or maps or even film of terrain can never really give you the full experience of the mountains. The weather is the great equalizer of climbing. No picture or film clip can prepare you for temperatures of 40 to 100 degrees below zero with 100 mile an hour winds in whiteout conditions. Maurice's journey to the foot of Everest was an incredible achievement. When he left England, he'd been a pilot with less than two months of real flying experience. He'd proved all the experts wrong by making the 5,000 mile flight despite every effort by governments, including his own, to stop him at every opportunity. He pressed on and he found a way. He was a man of no mountaineering experience but it made his way the 300 miles in disguise, mostly in the dark, through Sikkim and into Tibet. And he'd covered that distance in 25 days, 10 days less than the 1933 Rutledge expedition with all its Sherpas and pack animals. 
so Maurice had overcome every obstacle he'd faced. And I mean every obstacle in the larger sense. He had started and built successful businesses in foreign countries. He'd fought through and survived the bloodiest battles of World War I. And he learned to live with and thrive despite severe mental and physical impairments. But here he is standing at the base of Mount Everest. Is there any question after all he's been through that he would not be able to be successful at summoning Everest? Experience says he won't make it, but it's easy to see where Maurice's confidence comes from. Government officials and many so-called experts condemned Maurice's attempt on Everest as an elaborate form of suicide. I'm not so sure this is accurate. I haven't read a lot of accounts of suicide that involved self-torture and flying the route he flew, doing a 300-mile trek to climb a mountain. Climbing Everest itself seems like self-torture, much more than it seems like a guy who's looking for a grand way out of life. There's no pride or satisfaction in a moment of suffering. In the mountains, each person must endure and suffer alone, and that suffering comes without judgment or fanfare. It's just suffering. Heroes are not benighted by how much they suffer, but what they accomplished during that time of suffering. And that was Maurice's ultimate goal. He was looking to become a hero. Now the press had gotten word of Maurice's escape from Darjeeling, and the stories were starting to get out. It seems like the entire world was waiting for news of Maurice and were anxious for the stories of his trek and ultimately his climb. The newspapers and public were using words like brave, fearless, amazing man, the world, it seemed, were rooting for Maurice and were giving him an outside chance of success. But it can't be denied that the fact was that, barring a miracle, he had no chance of achieving this goal. One newspaper wrote a more sobering opinion of Maurice's chance of success. While well, one cannot but admire the pluck of Captain Maurice Wilson, in attempting to climb Mount Everest alone, his whole project and his training methods in particular seem to have been ill-judged. It is said that he has been fasting for five months and accustoming himself to a diet of figs, dates, and cereals. This will be just about as useful to him in his present venture as it would be if he were intending to swim the Atlantic. The experience of various expeditions which have already attempted the ascent prove beyond question that a large organization is essential if the mountain is to be conquered. Mr. George Mallory told me after the first expedition, he was killed on the second, that in his view Everest could be climbed only if the attack were organized with the same thoroughness as a wartime offensive. The physical discomfort compounded of intense cold, a perpetual blizzard, and the rarefied air produce on the mountain a feeling of depression and hopelessness. This can only be counteracted by human companionship, shelter, and proper food. Apart from these considerations, Everest also presents considerable technical climbing difficulties. Maurice had to know at this point that success was a long shot. But continuing on wasn't an act of blind stupidity or even defiance. It was a matter of faith. He was determined to test his theory of faith, and his unconventional training, and his overall plan for success. He was on the last step of his quest and thought this would be, at this point, the most challenging and dangerous. But it didn't seem any more challenging and dangerous than what he'd already done and been through. It just seemed like it might be a bit colder. One reporter wrote that Maurice had planned to climb Everest on faith and figs. That's not completely inaccurate, but Maurice's plans were not necessarily ill-conceived. He'd made meticulous plans. The problems were from unforeseen obstacles and lack of accurate information. But that information wouldn't be readily available for another 30 years. So on April 13, 1934, Maurice and his little team of three Sherpas and a pony reached the Rongbuk Monastery. On April 15th, Maurice received an invitation that he thought would now legitimize his journey and his goal. The head lama known as Dostral Rinpoche had previously met with members of the Rutledge expedition. In what was seemingly Maurice's first real deception, he told the lama that he had been a member of that expedition and was now back on a reconnaissance climb that would gain information about the route for the next British expedition. 
Meeting with the Lama was an important element to legitimizing his trip, but Maurice had another motive. The Rutledge expedition had left a lot of food and supplies for storage in the Rongbuk Monastery. The Lama was in charge of the monastery and the stores of supplies. Maurice, using the story of his connection to the Rutledge expedition, asked the Lama if he'd be allowed to go through and take whatever he might need for his own trip. It's unclear if Maurice found out or ever knew that the head lama knew that he was not being truthful. Having met every member of the Rutledge expedition, the head lama knew that he'd never met Maurice. But by this time, and with all the success Maurice had had with deception, it's understandable that he would confidently walk into this meeting unconcerned. For the head lama, what did it matter to him? Another Westerner wants to come and try to climb Everest. As long as he respects and adheres to the will of the head lama and the local traditions, no real harm is going to be had here. The head lama did allow Maurice to search through and take whatever he thought he might need to help him on his climb. Maurice grabbed a collapsible lantern, a tommy cooker that was developed in World War I and was so ineffective that one soldier during the war reported that it took two hours to boil a half pint of water. Keep in mind that Maurice was going to take this thing to elevation where heating time could double. Maurice also grabbed a mead tent. If he grabbed the smaller of the mead tents in the gear catch, it would have been six and a half feet by four feet and weighed 16 pounds. Keep in mind that current Everest expeditions and climbers cut toothbrushes in half to save weight. So the idea of adding a 16-pound tent to an already very heavy pack seems crazy. But this was the finest of the mountaineering tents at the time. In fact, Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay used a mead tent for their first successful ascent of Everest in 1953. So Maurice was using the state-of-the-art equipment at the time. So though Maurice was driven by faith, it doesn't seem that he was a follower of the traditional commandments, or he might have thought about the Eighth Commandment before stealing supplies. Maurice seemingly had his own motivation that was fueled and in his mind endorsed by faith. But exactly what his faith was in is a little unclear. The head lama invited Maurice to share a meal upon his return from Everest. Maurice graciously accepted and the two exchanged gifts. The head lama gave Maurice a bowl of grains and a half of a fried goat. Maurice gave the lama three rupees, which was the currency of the region, and he also gave him a scarf. Maurice wrote in his diary, quote, Luckily, he didn't know it was a scarf that I often used to wipe my knife after spreading margarine. Now, was Maurice being a jerk, or was this really all he had to offer? This doesn't appear to be meant as any disrespect. The two men through interpreters spoke for over 30 minutes and had a deep respect for each other. The head lama later spoke often about his respect and admiration and even affection for Maurice. Maurice told the head lama that in all his travels around the world that he's never felt so happy in anyone's company. Was this hyperbole or sincerity? The two men actually seemed to have a lot in common beyond the obvious differences. Both had embraced the solitary and spiritual life and had turned their lives over to faith and discipline. At the end of the evening, the monks gathered around to wish Maurice well. Maurice agreed to heliograph the monks along the way to help them follow his progress. A heliograph is a small mirror used for sending messages by reflecting the light of the sun. It was basically an early wireless communication device using Morse code. So you can add the reading of Morse code to the skill set of both Maurice and the monks of the Rongbuk Monastery. That evening, Maurice wrote, Everest looked wonderful this p.m., starting my work tomorrow. After an unexpected blessing from Sherpa Terzing, Maurice settled down for what would be the last night of comfort and security that he might ever enjoy. At dawn on April 16th, Maurice shouldered his 45-pound pack and to a swelling morning chant of the 300 monks in the monastery, he began his 12-mile walk up the Rongbuk Valley to the base of Mount Everest. Maurice planned on taking the same route George Mallory and Guy Bullock had scouted during the 1921 reconnaissance expedition. 
By 3 o'clock, Maurice had climbed 8 miles to around 17,600 feet and was about three-quarters of a mile from the 1933 Expedition's Camp 1. He picked a level spot on the rocky moraine and set up his tent before the sun went down, and he got his tommy stove going on a brew. Day one was done and relatively successful. He'd gone as far as he had originally planned, but he was feeling strong and confident and felt he could easily make the summit by April 21st, and that being his 36th birthday. April 17th and day two of his climb, it started off a little rough. His goal was to reach Rutledge's Camp 3 and to follow the East Rongbuk Glacier to a point about 2,200 feet above his current campsite. But after more than an hour on the Tommy stove, the water he was heating for his tea and oats was not more than lukewarm. Making it past Rutledge's Camp 1, he found route finding to be more difficult than he was expecting. He was heading into the glacier, and this would be his first real mountaineering experience, and likewise his first experience trying to navigate a glacier. After walking the moraines on the edges of the glacier, he realized that there was going to be no other choice but to actually climb it. His pack was really heavy, and he was layered up in wool clothes and was sweating in this clear, frigid air. He decided to shed some weight, and he left behind one of his two Tommy stoves. The reason for two stoves is as big a mystery as Maurice is himself. He also left behind half of his candles. Candles were his main source of light, and believe me, they were no LED headlamps in 1934. These things were all he had, and in the mountain, in the cold, in the wind, in a tent, living by candlelight, it just adds a whole other layer of difficulty. Now, trying to pick his way through the pinnacles and the troughs of the glacier was hard. He lost all sense of direction, and by midday, he was completely lost. Struggling to breathe with a pack lightened to about 40 pounds, the one good-armed World War I veteran with tuberculosis was fighting for every step. But fighting is what Maurice did, and he did it well. If giving up was ever considered, it was never written in any of his daily diaries. As the unstable ice creaked and moaned and breathing became even more difficult through a combination of altitude and lassitude, Maurice lacked the knowledge and experience to understand how to remedy this situation. An hour at higher ground and outside the glacier would have revived him, but with no mountaineer experience and no serious mountain travel in his background, he didn't have the slightest idea of how to help himself. Once again, he stopped at 3 o'clock. He'd set this time stamp every day to give himself enough time to set up camp and get as much rest as possible and try to make a brew, but he was already falling behind his goals. He'd climbed only 1,200 feet and not yet made it to Rutledge's camp, too. That night, he wrote in his diary, had a hell of a day on East Rombuk Glacier. Been floundering about doing 50 times more work than necessary. Reduced load two times, but only have done half the distance I had hoped. Height a bit under 19,000 feet. Looking forward to getting to Camp 3, from which the climb then really starts. Shall do my utmost to get there tomorrow. On day 3, April 18th, Maurice was nearly two days behind his self-prescribed schedule. He was up early and another breakfast of lukewarm tea and oats. He was trying to stay true to his planned diet, but this wasn't necessarily a good thing. Calories and hydration are an important part of health in the mountains. Maurice plodded slowly and awkwardly through the troughs of the snow-covered glacier. The weather began to change and snow flurries drifted down and the temperatures began to drop. Maurice pushed on under the weight of his heavy pack and his cork-lined boots and wool sweaters. It was a slow and torturous day. At four o'clock, Maurice had only made it halfway up the glacier, but he had made it to Camp 2. A good hot meal might have done a lot to revive him, but exhaustion and a depression had overcome him. He realized that he would not be standing on the summit on his birthday. He sat in the cold on the darkening slopes of Everest as snow began to fall heavily. He was at 19,000 feet and altitude issues were beginning to manifest. Decision-making was slowing. 
and Maurice sat for a very long time and until it was almost dark before he set up his tent and made his camp for the night. He had expected to be at Camp 3, at least by this day. He managed to set up his tent and crawl into his sleeping bag for what was going to be a long, cold night. The next morning he was up and rummaging through the supplies that had been left by the Rutledge expedition. He had hoped to find some food and perhaps some cigarettes, but all he managed to find was a pair of crampons. If Maurice had even a little mountaineering experience, he would have realized that crampons were far more valuable than cigarettes or even a small bit of food. It's astonishing to even think that he began his climb without crampons. If you're not aware, crampons are the spiked boot attachments that allow climbers to climb steep snow and ice by kicking the toe spikes into the ice and stepping up. Moving on from Camp 2, Maurice struggled navigating the terrain. A more experienced mountaineer would have taken a slightly different path through the glacier, but this is where Maurice's experience waned and his faith had taken over. Any mistake now could cost him his life. Faith and or luck were all he had at this point. On April 19th, he wrote in his diary, Another hellish day. About an hour after striking camp, it started snowing and hasn't stopped yet. Had to camp again only three quarters of a mile from the previous position. Got dreadful thirst on this damned glacier. Don't know why. Am eating good deal of snow and ice. On April 20th, the weather was clear, but bitterly cold. Maurice on the previous day had scouted a possible path through the glacier. He was making progress, but lassitude was causing a depressing fatigue, and he was now suffering both mentally and physically. And just eating snow and ice is not going to give him the hydration he's going to need. But this didn't stop him from stopping occasionally and admiring the incredible beauty that surrounded him. He wrote, The glaciers are marvelously beautiful, gorgeous duck egg blue. Too tired to take out the camera, but we'll get them on the way back. To be alone at nearly 20,000 feet, surrounded by a part of the earth that no human had ever touched, and Hearing nothing but the sounds of the mountain was emotional and a bit overwhelming. Maurice was awestruck, but he was not intimidated. The entire trip now hinged on Maurice reaching Camp 3, and what he'd hoped was a supply dump that included enough food that would allow Maurice to continue to the summit. He had read all the accounts from previous expeditions. Those accounts emphasized the difficulty of the upper slopes of the mountain and the North Call. The difficulty of navigating the East Rongbuk Glacier and getting to the base of the North Call had been understated, which for Maurice had been devastating to the information he based his plans upon. Without pictures, it's hard to visualize what Maurice was seeing. The glacier's fragmented sprawl of spires and towers of ice are hard to describe. They can be over a 100 feet tall and impossible to see over or around. It's only by detailed maps or exploration that climbers can find their way through the maze of ice and blind cul-de-sacs that make up the glaciers. In his account of the 1922 expedition, John Noel described how the team's Sherpa porters established a series of camps up the mountain. The second, which he called Frozen Lake Camp, was at 19,500 feet, and the third, Snowfield Camp, was at 21,000 feet. Noel wrote, between Frozen Lake and Snowfield Camps, the glacier was twisted and broken into a belt some two miles wide of broken, splintered bergs of ice, some towering to a height of a hundred feet. Here the men would strap steel spikes onto the soles of their boots and set out along one of the strangest paths imaginable. They would find their way, turning and twisting in every possible direction, past the towers and pinnacles of ice, avoiding fissures fifty feet deep, descending walls of ice a hundred feet in depth, following old, widened crevasses, climbing ladders that we cut into the ice, guided by a line of little flags we fixed to wooden pegs, hammered to the tops of the ice hillocks. These showed the way when storms and mist concealed the more distant landmarks and snow covered the foot tracks. We named this region Fairyland of Ice. Actually, it had been a work of many, many days to discover a path by which we could penetrate the maze. Bergs and cliffs and crevices blocked the way a dozen times to the first exploring party 
and were circumnavigated only by retracing the steps starting afresh from some new direction. Following his 1980 solo climb of Everest, Reinhold Messner wrote of passing through the glaciers on his way up to the advanced base camp below the North Col. He wrote, On the third day after leaving base camp, we continue on our way along the central moraine, which has melted a trough between the walls of the glacier. So we pass between icebergs, seracs, and ice walls. In Tibet, not only the clouds change in the wind, but also the mountains, the hills, and the ice. I can literally see that this high plateau is alive like the sea, that it smells like hide, that it vibrates like a sea of lava. On Saturday, April 21st, Maurice made two entries into his diary. As we discussed earlier, he wished himself a happy 36th birthday and commented that he'd had hellish cold feet all night. He wrote that the sun was just up and he was finishing breakfast and that he would be going back into his tent to try to get a little more sleep. Now, Maurice seems to be showing signs of serious fatigue and lassitude and a debilitating mountain chill that can creep into your limbs. Previously, he was up and ready to move, but today he's moving a little slower and seemingly in no rush. Maurice finally managed to get up and moving, packing up his tent and his gear, but that had to be hard. He set out that day, but he didn't get very far. He was quickly overtaken by a snowstorm and had to get his camp set up again before he froze to death. I know I keep bringing this up, but things are now getting desperate. He's in a snowstorm. He'd reported in his diary that his eyes and throat were bad and he was suffering from lassitude and possibly altitude sickness and the freezing of his limbs. And yeah, he's got one good arm in TB. With numb limbs, lassitude-affected breathing, and one usable arm, Maurice managed to get his tent set up in the snowstorm and he crawled inside. This was going to be another long, cold night. Food now was an issue. He'd hoped to be at Camp 3 by now and taking advantage of the food left by the Rutledge expedition, but he was closer to death than he was to Camp 3. With his canvas tent anchored in the snow at 20,000 feet and a blizzard blowing outside, Maurice laid in his wool sweaters in his 1934 sleeping bag and began to take serious stock of his situation. Maurice wrote in his diary, Discretion, better part of valor, and even a Herculean effort could not make Camp 3 in time weather bad. At 6 a.m. on Monday, April 23rd, Maurice packed a small rucksack, ate a slice of bread and some snow, and taking advantage of a break in the weather, he headed back down the mountain. He passed Camp 2, Camp 1, beyond two glaciers and Rutledge's base camp. Snow had covered most of his path, and by Maurice's account, he stumbled, fell, rolled, and tumbled his way down the mountain. After descending 4,000 feet, he hiked the 12 miles through the Rongbuk Valley back to the monastery. Given his physical and mental condition, he somehow through desperation or self-preservation or perhaps the faith that he so often relied on, but he was able to once again achieve the impossible. Getting out of the situation on the mountain and back to the monastery in itself is a life-changing experience. But at 10 p.m., he stumbled back into the monastery. Maurice was able to find his way down the glacier and the lower slopes of Everest and covered it all in 16 hours, the distance it took him three days to climb. It was and is an incredible effort, given the elevation, his experience, and his physical and mental condition. Arriving back at the monastery, he was met by the three Sherpas who had helped him get to the Rongbuk Valley. They took his rucksack, rolled out his sleeping bag next to a fire, and covered Maurice in blankets, and quickly cooked a hot meal of rice, soup, and fried meats. Maurice called it the most gorgeous pot of tea I've ever had in my life. Maurice spent the first few days in bed regaining his strength and hoping his eyesight would be fully restored. He knew he'd been lucky. Many who had attempted the mountain did not return, and others had suffered from snow blindness and frostbite. With the help of his three Sherpas, Maurice was gaining strength and regaining his health. It's unfair to make 
broad judgments about people, but I feel confident in saying that most people who had experienced what Maurice had experienced to this point would have looked at themselves in the mirror and said, mm, you gave it a good effort. Now it's time to go home. Maurice's convalescence made him more confident and more driven. He had now actually experienced the conditions on the mountain and felt better prepared to try again. He had gained respect and knew that achieving his goal was going to require a superhuman effort. He wrote in his diary, Weren't we told that faith can move mountains? If I have faith enough, I know that I can climb Mount Everest. Though we still believe that God would guide him, he took his experience and made a new plan that he was sure would succeed. The plan for the second attempt came with some modifications. Two of his Sherpas, Twang and Tursig, became sick. Twang more seriously than Tursig. Maurice gave Twang a deed of assignment for the pony. Maurice also gave Twang a letter to present to the authorities in Darjeeling, reading that in the event of his own death, the three Sherpas would be exonerated of all blame for assisting him in his forbidden journey. Though still sick, Terzig was recovering. It was agreed that he and Reinzig would climb with Maurice to Camp 3, a location just below the icefall that guards the North Call. At Camp 3, Maurice would set out alone to summit Everest. At first light on May 12, 1934, as Duke Ellington's song Cocktails for Two hit number one on the American music charts, Maurice Wilson, along with Twang and Rinzig, set out for Camp 3, and an inevitable drama that would play out on the slopes of Mount Everest. Walking as the sun rose over the mountains and revealing itself in both its beauty and its stark, unforgiving danger, it's one thing to walk into a hard situation but another to go in a second time, knowing the situation is harder and more deadly than you'd ever imagined. They were entering a very desolate world that Maurice described as black, wintry, dead, unmeasured, without herb, insect, or beast, or shape or sound of life. If you're old enough to remember the movie Armageddon, where a team of astronauts are sent on a suicide mission to land on an asteroid and blow it up by placing a bomb, then you might understand a correlation here. Three people setting off on what has been described by authorities for the previous two years as an elaborate form of suicide were now setting off into the dark and cold and white hole of Everest. The goal was to move fast and to reach Camp 1 by the first night. Maurice was strong and feeling good, but Twang wasn't fully recovered from his illness and was struggling. Twang never complained, but Maurice could see that he was struggling. They made it to Camp 1 by 3 o'clock, and as the sun went down, so did the temperatures. At 10 p.m., Maurice crawled out of his tent to try to fully appreciate their position on the mountain, but the temperatures had dropped to 112 below zero, and he quickly crawled back into his tent and tried to sleep. By 3 p.m. the following day, the little team had made it to Camp 2, and Maurice was filled with confidence. Rinzig hunted around and found the rucksack Maurice had discarded as he descended the mountain a few weeks before. The following day, with the goal of Camp 3, Rinzig showed Maurice the easiest route and the one used by the Rutledge expedition that went into the glacier troughs. Once again, lassitude descended on the climbers, but... As the angle of the climbing lessened, and with many rest stops along the way, the three men began to feel better, and at noon they passed Maurice's previous high point. Climbing out of the stagnant air, but also out of the cover of the glacier, they were once again getting hit with searing winds, while at the same time seeing the vast expanse of the upper slopes of Everest. They were at 21,000 feet, and on the edge of the desolate and windswept Camp 3. Camp 3 lays halfway between the head of the glacier and the foot of the great icefall that rises 1,500 feet and ends on the shoulder of the North Call. After setting up camp, Maurice did a little scouting trip to the base of the icefall. It was at the icefall that he realized that this was going to be the first real mountaineering problem. And it was there that Maurice might have understood how truly ill-equipped he was to fulfill this quest of his. Previous expeditions, including the Rutledge expedition of the 1920s, found the icefall to be very difficult, and some of the finest climbers of their generation had struggled on this section of their climbs. 
Maurice had decided not to bring crampons, hoping that he would have found the set that he'd tossed it out of the gear and food cache at Camp One. Those crampons were never found, and now Maurice was faced with climbing up ice in slick bottom boots. This was going to require cutting ice steps with his ice axe. Cutting steps in the ice is not in itself too difficult, but standing on slick ice at 21,000 feet with one good arm, two bad lungs, and no experience is a bit of a challenge. Maurice had unrealistically hoped that the steps cut in by the Rutledge party years before would still somehow be available. That was not the case, and logic would tell you that those steps would not remain in the ice, but overconfidence and bravado can create a situation of false expectations. Careful scouting and with Rinzig's help, they found a climbable section. The going was slow, and they had to cut an ice staircase up the entire 400-foot section of steep ice. Rinzig located the food cache that was left by Rutledge, so for the next day, the three men ate very well. Honey, butter, cheese, anchovy paste, chocolate cookies, and tins of soup and meat filled their 40-pound provision box. On May 15th, Maurice decided to take the day off and rest, and spent most of that day sleeping in his tent. That would end up being a good decision. From May 16th to May 21st, a storm raged outside, and the temperatures and conditions made it impossible or even safe to leave the tent. On May 22nd, almost a year since he left England, and what would have become one of the greatest adventures in human history, Rinzig agreed to lead Maurice on what was remaining of the old Rutledge route, but told Maurice that he would stay with him only until noon, so that he'd have time to get back to the camp by dark. The two men struggled. Maurice cutting steps into steep ice, and Rinzig carrying Maurice's pack and trying to balance on the slippery steps. If Maurice would have fallen at this point, he would have hit Rinzig and both men would disappear down the mountain. Now shortly after noon, May 22nd, Rinzig and Maurice shook hands, wished each other well, and shared a couple of moments, remembering the astonishing journey that had got him to this spot on Everest. As Rinzig made his way back down the mountain and out of sight, Maurice suddenly felt very alone. He always favored solitude and even wrote about his enjoyment of it on the mountain during his first attempt. But this was different. He was alone and about to be out of reach of literally everyone in the world. Maurice made camp and crawled into a sleeping bag and tried to rest. Tomorrow he knew was going to be a long, hard, and lonely day. He'd planned to be at the call by nightfall, but here he was in his tent and resting. He had only traveled one-third of the distance he had planned for the day. May 23rd was surprisingly warm. The sun was out and it was clear. In 1997, Jim Kachaver, in writing about his ski experiences in Colorado for the Chicago Tribune, wrote tongue-in-cheek that Colwar is French for cold, narrow place to die. I think that line could apply to the Colwar Maurice was staring up at. In the distance, Maurice could hear the thunder of avalanches. He was terrified of being caught in a Colwar in an avalanche. He also knew that he was very near the location that the seven porters were killed by an avalanche. That was with Mallory on the lead in the 20s. We talked about that in a previous episode. He continued to cut steps in the snow and move up. It took him three hours to climb the Colwar. He pitched his tent on a snow shelf and perched it downward at about a 20-degree angle. Maurice was lucky that night. The mountain was calm. Had a blizzard kicked up, it would have swept his tent right off the mountain and down the glacier the thousand feet below. In episode three, we discussed the challenges Maurice faced on May 23rd. Here again is that story. His first obstacle of the day was a large crevasse that bisected the mountain. He inched his way to the lip and looked into what seemed to be a bottomless pit of sheer icy blue walls. Feeling the unstable snow beneath him, he worked his way along the edge hoping to find a snow bridge to cross the crevasse. In modern Everest climbing, aluminum ladders are dropped across these crevasses and the climbers just walk very carefully over these horizontal ladders to safer terrain. No such convenience for Maurice. 
He searched for a couple hours for a natural snow bridge that would cross this icy divide. Ice bridges are tricky. You never know how stable or strong that bridge might be. It's a band of thick ice or sometimes just snow that has breached a couple of points that cross this bottomless hole they call crevasses. There is no testing to find out if a snow bridge is strong. Snow bridges are scary and dangerous when you're climbing with a team. It's a complete act of faith to cross a snow bridge alone with no rope and no hope of rescue if it collapses. After finding a snow bridge and recognizing its obvious danger, Maurice decided to look for another way. And for several more hours, he searched for another way to get across that crevasse. But he had no luck. He was at a crossroads. Was this going to be the end of his journey? The end of his life? Or both? He sat down on a snowbank next to the bridge and ate his lunch. After eating five very dry biscuits as slowly as he possibly could, he knew it was decision time. He moved onto his knees and he prayed. He knew that if he truly had faith, he could put the fear and danger aside and he'd be fine no matter what. So he stepped up softly and carefully onto the bridge. One step and then another. These first steps were not strides. He stepped out left foot first then brought his right foot up next to his left. He tried to minimize any vibration, but then he thought with two feet together at the same time, he was putting all his weight in one spot. Was there a right way to cross a snow bridge? With a deep breath and the knowledge that this snow bridge was only as strong as his faith, he took long, slow strides across the bridge to the other side. He was across the snow bridge, but was he really any safer now? It was 1934. He was alone on Everest in high winds and sub-zero temperatures, and he just crossed a snow bridge that he didn't know would even exist in an hour if he needed to retreat. And looking up, he was facing overhanging 60-foot walls of rock and ice, and he was all out of biscuits. Maurice found himself at the base of a chimney formation in the rock that he'd seen from Camp 3. He knew that this was the only way up and through the rock and ice spires that surrounded him. He decided to camp at the base of the chimney. He set up his tent at a slope of about 35 degrees and dug in packed snow around his tent to keep him from rolling off the mountain. Once again, he was too exhausted to cook, so he crawled in his tent and he was becoming weaker by the hour. It seems that he was not only suffering physically, but mentally as well. His decision-making was becoming quite questionable. May 24th, after a long, cold night, Maurice was up and making breakfast. It took two hours for the water to boil. Maurice used his matches to improvise a candle stand for his stove. The matches became useless as they were quickly saturated with grease. He now had no way of making heat or light. What do you do when a basic form of survival is not available? Well, if you're Maurice, you set off in sub-zero temperatures to climb the chimney that you hope will be the gateway to the highest place on Earth. After seven hours of trying to climb the chimney section of rock and ice, Maurice stumbled back into his tent. This is where you again recognize that experience could have made a difference. Though the chimney is daunting for novice mountaineers, an experienced climber could have climbed the chimney fairly easily in about an hour. But with no crampons and no experience, a chimney like this would literally be impossible. Maurice realized he needed help, and if he was going to achieve his objective, He quickly formed a plan to help him do that. Reading his diary is like reading a story. I want to interact with this character. I want to interact with Maurice and tell him things and warn him. But I'm from his future. And sitting here in a warm office, 
Even if I could give him advice from the future, I don't think he'd listen to me. His new plan was to return to Camp 3, rest for a couple days, and convince Rinzig to return with him to help him get up the chimney and on to Camp 4, where from there he was sure he could reach the summit alone. In order to do this, he'd have to backtrack over difficult and dangerous terrain. He'd have to navigate the Kalwar and the snow bridge that so horrified him on the way up. And that's if it was still there. If the snow bridge was gone, he was trapped. Luckily, though seeming much more fragile, the snow bridge was still there. As were the steps he'd cut into the Kalwar. Things were again turning his way. Once again, ambition, determination, and faith were carrying him. Twang was still not physically able to go on. Rinzig, who had previously climbed up to the 27,000-foot level, knew that with the equipment and experience that Maurice had, there was no way that he was going to succeed, and he refused to go along. We discussed in Episode 2 the interaction between Maurice and the Sherpas during this time. Was this blind ambition and selfishness? Was he offering any glory to the Sherpas? Well, not really. He wanted help to a point. Then his plan was to surge on to glory alone. Both Sherpas had grown up in the region and at high altitude. Their thinking was much clearer than Maurice's. Trying to convince someone that what they're planning is dangerous can be wasted words when the person believes they are safe and protected behind a veil of faith. Maurice wrote, It's not faith that wavers when its prayers remain unanswered. Was Maurice's faith really that strong, or could he now have doubt? All his theories about how to climb Everest have been disproved. He's faced conditions that no prayer has mitigated, but still here he was. He rummaged through his kit and found the flag of friendship, the silk pennant signed by all his friends and that was given to him when he took off from England. He realized now he was going to have to go back there and do it by himself. He carefully folded the flag and grabbed some oxygen and a bare minimum of supplies. Maurice figured if all went well, he could climb the mountain in four or five days. His own experience should have told him that nothing had gone as planned since the day he stepped foot in the Everest biplane three years before. He was alive, but things had not gone well. Getting close to goals can be intoxicating. The risks and disappointments fall away for the thoughts of glory and redemption that will be waiting at the end of the journey. Reinhold Messner wrote about the decision-making on Everest and how it feels to be so close but facing self-destruction. Messner writes, and I quote, Up here, life is brutally racked between exhaustion and willpower. Self-conquest becomes compulsion. Why don't I go down? This is no occasion to. I cannot simply give up without reason. I wanted to make the climb. I still want to. Curiosity. Ambition of wanting to be the first. All these superficial incentives have vanished. Whatever it is that drives me is planted much deeper than I or the magnifying glass of psychologists can detect. Day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, step by step, I force myself to do something against which my body rebels. The night of May 28th, Maurice slept well. It could be that he'd had the distinct feeling that he was not alone. The Sherpas were asleep in their tents several yards away, but Maurice felt sure there was someone sleeping beside him. He took comfort in knowing that he was not and would not be alone. Faith or fantasy, in these moments, if it's real to you, then it is real. On May 29th, Maurice was up and preparing to leave. The Sherpas pleaded with him to return with them. They'd been with Maurice for months and months. He was more than an employer now. He was a friend, and watching a friend walk into death was not something they could simply let happen. The discussion ended when Maurice asked them, Wait here for ten days, and if I don't come back, return by yourselves. They watched Maurice with his few pieces of equipment move slowly, up and alone, through the icefall towards the slopes of the North Call.
just how much Maurice suffered during the following days isn't completely known. On May 30th, he wrote that he was too weak to get out of bed. But on May 31st, the sun was shining and he wrote in his diary very simply, Off again, gorgeous day. He pitched his tent a few hundred feet above Camp 3. The last entries in his diary were incoherent scribbles. Sometime during the night of May 31st, 1934, Maurice Wilson of Bradford, England, World War I hero and keeper of a superhuman faith in a borrowed tent, 21,500 feet above sea level and 8,000 feet below his goal, died quietly and alone. It was July when the rumors of Maurice's death were first reported. Papers all over the world led with headlines like Lone Death on Everest. London's Daily Express printed the following as reported by its Calcutta correspondent. Lone Climber Dead on Everest Man who carried Union Jack last seen plodding over the ice with his pack. Daily Express correspondent, Calcutta, Thursday. It is feared that Mr. Maurice Wilson, the Bradford man who set out to plant a Union Jack on the summit of Mount Everest, has perished in his attempt. The porters who accompanied Mr. Wilson for part of the way have returned to Darjeeling after waiting in vain for the lone climber to return from the topmost slopes of the mountain. They state that when the party reached the height of 21,000 feet and found the camp established by last year's Everest expedition, they pointed out to Mr. Wilson that it was impossible to proceed further without more porters and ropes. But he decided to go on alone. When they saw him last, he was crossing a glacier carrying a light tent, three loaves of bread, two tins of porridge, a camera, and his Union Jack. The report went on to describe how Wilson had traveled to Everest disguised as a Tibetan priest and had covered the distance in a record 25 days. This is regarded as a splendid achievement, added the report, especially as most of the route was covered at night. It continued, Mr. Wilson hoped to find the tracks of last year's expedition and lengths of rope abandoned by previous climbers, but in this he was disappointed. After he left the porters, his route lay over a glacier, which is the scene of frequent avalanches. It has treacherous crevasses and the temperatures of 50 degrees below freezing point. Mountaineers regard this region as one where only an experienced party roped together have a reasonable prospect of getting through. It is surmised that Mr. Wilson met his death in that treacherous area at an altitude of 23,000 feet. As a lone feat, his achievement of getting so far with such scanty equipment was a magnificent effort. But there is little hope that he can still be alive. Predictably, his mother held out hope for his survival. That hope lasted a year when on July 9, 1935, British mountaineer Eric Shipton, while leading an Everest reconnaissance expedition in preparation for a full 1936 assault, discovered Maurice Wilson's body. Maurice was found curled up next to his small pack. He had on a pullover sweater, flannel pants, and woolen underwear. A small rope lay next to him that was the remaining guy wire for his tent that had long since been shredded and was lost on the mountain. Eric Shipton and his team organized a simple funeral service and committed Maurice's body to a crevasse, and one member of the team reported, We tipped in his body and he completely disappeared. The team, using Maurice's ice axe, constructed a small marker on the spot where Maurice was found. In his poem Excelsior, Longfellow wrote nearly 100 years before Maurice's death an epitaph that somehow seems appropriate. He wrote, There in the twilight, cold and gray, lifeless but beautiful he lay, and from the sky, serene and far, a voice fell like a falling star. It is somewhat poetic that Maurice Wilson's body to this day is interred on Mount Everest. It was the place of his greatest desire and really his greatest success. Reaching the summit, as we've said several times, is a nice reward for a hard-fought journey, but 
It's not the summit that defines the effort. It's the determination and perseverance and sheer will that will carry forward, either in the person or in the inspiration that that person's efforts inspired. In the case of Maurice, it's a sad, simple fact that his achievements are looked on by history as a carnival sideshow instead of the forward-thinking, game-changing style that his effort really was. Ask serious mountaineers today how they would want to climb Everest, and they might say the way Messner did it, or the way Steck did it. It's fast, it's light. But no one says the way Maurice Wilson did it, or at least tried it. And I personally think they should. He was the visionary of this type of climbing that is so prevalent today. So ends the story of Maurice Wilson, a complicated man who sought greatness and admiration, but ended up alone and nearly forgotten. Mount Everest was finally summited on May 29, 1953, by Edmund Hillary and Tenzig Norgay. Some rumors around Maurice continue today. Early on, I mentioned that there were reports that Maurice was a cross-dresser and that uh, he was found wearing women's underwear. There's no evidence of this, and there's no reports either in his personal diary or by people who knew him well that he enjoyed cross-dressing. In 1960, a team reportedly found a woman's high heel shoe near where they believed Maurice Wilson had died. That story is so ridiculous it barely warrants discussion. As I've said, climbers at that elevation cut any and all weight possible. This was even true in Maurice's time, so the idea that someone would bring an unusable shoe is pretty hard to believe. Maurice Wilson was obstructed at every opportunity and overcame all that was put in front of him. No organization, government, or person could stand in his way. But what they could not do, Everest and his own ego did strikingly quick. And Maurice's approach and style were decades ahead of his time. I hope you enjoyed this season of High Adventure Podcast. We'll be back soon with a new season and a new story. Keep an eye on our social media pages to find out more. Thank you for listening. My name is Jeff Bargin, and this is the High Adventure Podcast. Lying on his deathbed watching the picture show The product of the night The bottle and some smoke A boomer's tricks and a woman's
You know my mama, she says I'm nothing like them She told me so over a tarot card and a bottle of gin Sing She told me, son, you'd better hit the road and don't look back They say hang you for all their sins Your soul is sure. 